The President, you may be seated. The Chamber is now back in session. There was a request yesterday by the lead co-lawyers regarding the request for the list of new witnesses whose names were decided upon by the pre-trial detention by the pre-trial chamber in its recent decision the chamber therefore requests the lead co-lawyers to make their oral request That shall be done at the end of today's hearing, that is at 4 p.m. this afternoon. Again, toward the end of this hearing today, the lead co lawyers will make their oral presentation or request on the list. I would like to give the floor now to Judge Lavange. Thank you, Mr. President. What the Chamber would require of the civil party co-lawyers is that they should clarify the requests they wish to make following decisions that shall be rendered by the pretrial Chamber, admitting new civil parties in the group, in the consolidated group of civil parties, we would like to have those clarifications this afternoon at about 4 p.m. In order to be sure that I have properly understood the judges, I would like to know whether at that time, at this 4 p.m., you would like us to clarify our requests or to provide you with lists. Ce, ce que nous souhaitons, que vous what we expect of you is to clarify the request you will make following decisions of the pretrial chamber. Admitting um, say 1,700 civil parties. Mrs. Uh, Elizabeth, uh, we will make those requests orally, of course. The President, I'd like now to give the floor to the prosecution. Mr. Ang Odom, you may proceed. Ang Odom. Good morning, Mr. President. I'd like to seek your permission from my client, Mr. Inseri, to rest in the room downstairs as he has a problem with his back and his uh, spine. And I'd like to seek your permission so that he can participate from the room downstairs. The President, the Chamber has heard the request by the Defence Council, and it appears that the accused seems to suffer from the condition mentioned by his counsel. Therefore, the Chamber allows Mr. Ian Sari to leave the courtroom and he can participate the proceedings via audio-visual communication in the 
waiting room downstairs security guards you are instructed to bring Mr. Insari to the waiting room downstairs and the ICT section please linked the proceedings to the equipment downstairs The President, once again, I'd like to give the floor now to the co-prosecutors to respond to the presentation on the issue before the break by the Defense Council. Chandra Resmay. Thank you, Mr. President. My name is Chandra Resmay, Deputy Co-Prosecutor. Good morning, Your Honours. Good morning, everyone. In relation to the preliminary objections raised by the Insari Defense, on behalf of the prosecution, I'd like to submit to the Chamber to reject these preliminary objections that Insari shall not be prosecuted for the crimes of genocide and other crimes because of the royal amnesty and pardoned by the royal degree in 1996. I have two arguments to raise before the chamber first. The royal degree has its clear limited scope and does not intend to bar any prosecution of major crimes committed by Ying Sari as alleged during the democratic Kampuchea regime between 75 to 79. Second, for the sake of argument, even if the scope of the real degree intends to include the amnesty for the genocide, this chamber has an obligation under both national and international laws so not honor or support the prevention of prosecutions against Ian Sari for other major crimes he is allegedly committed during the period of democratic Kampuchea as stated in the closing order. My submission today, Your Honor, will highlight the key arguments of the co-prosecutors. In our written submissions, various written submissions on this particular issue, and that we urge Your Honors to make your decision in relation to all these statements. I'd like to raise the arguments in relation to the preliminary objections, and my colleague, Mr. William Smith, will provide the second argument. I'd like now to present our arguments regarding the scope of the royal pardon and amnesty for Ying Sari. In the typical reading of the royal degree for pardon or amnesty, it clearly indicates the two situations where pardon or amnesty given to the accused relied mainly on the English language. However, we submit that there is no such situation of the two include the intention to prevent the prosecution for those crimes committed by Ian Sari. The English translation used by the Royal Government's Working Group in charge of the work of the ECCC, which has been certified by the Defence Councils, reads in Article 1, The pardon is given to Ying Sari, Deputy former Deputy Prime Minister in charge of foreign affairs in the government of Democratic Cambodia for the sentence of death and confiscation 
of all his property imposed by order of the People's Revolutionary Tribunal of Phnom Penh, dated 19 August 1979, and secondly, an amnesty for prosecution under the law to outlaw the Democratic Kampuji group promulgated by Rich Crom Number no. 1, NS 94, dated 14 July 1994. The translation by the pretrial chamber, that is from the ITU, on the use of the word amnesty in, true, in the true subparagraphs, and the translation by the trial chamber, which also derived from the ITU, using the word pardons in the first subparagraph, and there is a grammatical arrangement, and for that reason, the word pardon is also used in the second subparagraph. However, it is clearly understood that the royal degree in the Khmer language has a binding effect of enforcement. Various translations exist, as mentioned by the pre-trial chamber, and also as agreed by the defense counsel, that they were used in the royal degree, according to the Khmer meaning, which has the equivalent in English as to lift the guilt, in Khmer, read Lek Leng To. And this term of phrase encompasses both the pardon and the amnesty in the Khmer context. There is also evidence that there are existing Cambodian legal documents before the issuance of the royal degree in 1996. For instance, I'd like to show an, a, a legal document in the degree number 28, dated 20 June 1988, issued by the State's Council of the People's Republic of Cambodia in Article 2, it reads, any convict who fulfills the condition in Article 1 shall receive amnesty in cases where those convicts have served two-thirds of the overall imprisonment or at least 15 years for the life sentence. Your Honours, it is clear from this example that the word in Khmer, Ka Lek Leng To, or in English, lifting the guilt, as used in the degree of 1996, which used for the reduction of sentence and nothing more than that. Therefore, the arguments raised by the Defense Council in document E51-10 in paragraph 6, that within this context, the word guilt may encompass more than simply a sentence this means they do not consider the use of this word in the Khmer language in their legal profession. As the Cambodian lawyers and judges clearly know that this is just one of the examples of legal documents established within the 80s and the 90s that use the word lifting the guilt within the context of the reductions of sentence after conviction. Therefore, the arguments raised by the Defense Council in document E51-10 in paragraph 6, that's the word amnesty in reference to the sentence to death, which was abolished in the degree, shall be the word that shall be used. Because this word has a better understanding than the word pardoned, which does not carry any meaning at all in both the English and the Khmer context. On the contrary, in the English, the word pardon and anesthesia 
require no contextual meaning because these two terms are clearly defined. Journals, I'd like to give you an example in the Black Law Dictionary. The word pardon is defined as the act or an instance of officially nullifying punishment or other legal consequences of a crime. And also in the same dictionary, the word amnesty is defined as a pardon extended by the government to a group or class of persons, usually for a political offense. The act of a sovereign, sovereign power officially forgiving certain classes of persons who are subject to trial but have not yet been convicted. Therefore, in English, the word pardon is related to the reduction of sentence or the nullifications of the sentence of a convict. And the word amnesty is related to the protection of an individual who shall not be prosecuted in the future. Similarly, in the English language, as well as in the Khmer language. The idea that the pardon shall be understood broadly than the word amnesty is incorrect. In fact, it is the opposite. Because the word amnesty is to provide a future protection from prosecution and pardon is only for the reduction of sentence for the existing conviction. Your Honours, therefore, contradicting to the position of the Defence Council that the interpretation of the degree in the Khmer language would lead to inconsistencies due to the true distinct characters or the contextual character of the word lifting the guilt, meaning pardon or amnesty. As I stated in the English language above, this is a failure to, an to analyze or to consider the customs and the legal application in the Khmer language in relation to the use of this word. For that reason, the prosecution agrees in principle with the defense counsel that the intention of the legislature and the negotiators that shall be considered in the interpretation of the royal degree is the actual intention deriving from that royal degree and other existing documents which are already in the possession of the trial chamber. And for that reason, there is no need to summon any witness to provide clarification before this court, as all the documents are already in the case file. Looking at the first section of the royal degree, it is clear that the royal degree limits the scopes on the nullification of the enforcement of the decision to convict Yin Sari to death and the confiscation of his property imposed by the order after he was trialed by the People's Revolutionary Tribunal in Phnom Penh in 1979. This means that in this portion of the royal degree, it does not state the amnesty from the prosecution of those crimes. However, it's the reduction of sentence 
after being convicted. This actually means a pardon. However, for a pardon to be valid, in order to avoid future prosecution for the same crimes, and as the word pardon is defined, it requires the accused to be tried, to be convicted, and in general, shall serve portions of such sentence. This pardon does not bar future prosecution for crimes, for other crimes committed during the period of the Democratic Campuchia. Jonas, I'd like now to briefly discuss on the second part of the royal degree where it mentions the amnesty for prosecution under the law to outlaw the Democratic Kampuchea group to Insari. As the Defense Council argue appropriately in their written submission, the word in Khmer, Lek Leng Tu, in this context, means amnesty for future prosecution only under the law to outlaw the Democratic Kampuchea group. The Defense Council argued that the future prosecution, as he was already as he already received amnesty for prosecution under that law, include other crimes that he's been alleged or charged to commit during the Democratic Kampuchea period. Such interpretation is inappropriate. Therefore, in any circumstance, such analysis does not lend any weight to prevent future prosecution of Ying Sari for other crimes he committed during that period. Amnesty is precise and clear and only related to the prosecution of other crimes mentioned in the law to outlaw the Democratic Cambodia, that is in Article 4, it talks about the offenses of secession, distraction against the royal government, distraction against organs of public authority or incitement, and also the other offense is in Article 9, that is the violation of the right of the people by using this law to outlaw the Democratic Cambodia group. These are the two new offenses defined by this law, and it is not, or it does not carry any. application, retroactive application at all. The law to outlaw the Democratic Committee does not have the meaning as argued by the Defense Council that it established various criminal offenses for those crimes committed during the Democratic Committee. And this, the, the law does not have the intention as raised by the Defense Council in their written submission because the only basis for the prosecution of the Khmer Rouge member for the various crimes committed during the period of Democratic Cambodia, they shall be prosecuted by the Khmer Rouge Tribunal. In order to reach an interesting conclusion, it is important that the Defense Council relies on Article 3 of this law, which states that members of the political organization or the military forces of the Democratic Kampuji group or any persons who commit crimes of murder, rape, robbery, or people's property, the destruction of public and private property, etc., shall be sentenced according to existing criminal law. 
the interpretation by the Defense Council that Article 3 forms the only legal basis for prosecution of the, the, of the Khmer Rouge members for the crimes they committed during the period of the Mirkote Kampuchea is fundamentally flawed for the following reasons. One, Article 3 is a statement which clearly states that the Cambodian criminal law at that time is not within the scope of the law to allow the Khmer rules and cannot be applied for the various acts of the members of the Khmer rules or any person. This is a statement. It's not an establishment of a law. And this law does not substitute any existing criminal law or set aside the criminal law in 1956. It is merely a statement to strengthen the application of the facts that sentence shall be carried out. Besides that, in the absence of Article 3 of the law to allow the democratic community group, it does not mean that the existing Cambodian law cannot be applied. For that reason, it is not the only authority to prosecute members of the Khmer Rouge for various crimes they committed during the period of the Mirukati Kampuchea, as argued by the Defense Council. The arguments by the Defense Council that the provision that it shall be sentenced according to existing criminal law, it means that the, the charges are not consistent with the domestic law. This is clear that this is an intention to delay or to disrupt the entire application of this provision because prosecution shall be done according to the domestic law. Number two, Article 3 refers to the, com to the crimes committed after the coming into existence of the law, that is, after the July 1994 and not before that. If the intention is for the crimes committed during the Democratic Kampuchea, it would have worded it differently that were committed. In addition, besides the amnesty as stated in Article 5 of the law to outlaw the Democratic Kampuchea group, this law does not have any retroactive effect. Jonas, the third point that I'd like to present is the following. The offenses stated in Article 3, even if they are serious, the wording used in the criminal law does not have the same weight to the gravity of the crimes committed by Ying Sari. And the arguments by the defense counsel that the, the serious crimes, including the domestic laws, for example, murder, rape, robbery, or people's property, the destruction of public and private property, etc., is not correct. As mentioned in the list, it is not consistent with the interpretation of any other statutory rules both national and international. The only retroactive provision in the law to outlaw democratic amnesty is Article 5, which does not create the amnesty for the various crimes committed during the democratic Kampuchea, but those amnesties are only for those people who are not senior leaders of the democratic Kampuchea and only for members of the Democratic Kampuchea group who reintegrate within the government of Cambodia, that is six months after the July 1994. The, the other important point is that the senior Democratic Kampuchea, including Ying Sari, need to be prosecuted Therefore, Your Honours, we submit that you reject in its entirety the argument that the law to outlaw the, the, the Khmer rules provides amnesty for the prosecutions of crimes in the future solely based on the arguments raised by the Defence Council that 
the provision in this law and through the purpose and the intention of this law. To conclude the word, the, the actual wording used in the royal degree on Amazon, there is no intention in relation to the amnesty for the future prosecution of genocide or other crimes committed by Yingzari. In 1996, the legislatures explained this point. And also in 1996, the Prime Minister also explained to the public that the wording in the decree is clearly sought out beforehand. As he read, if you study the wording in the royal degree, you can see the possibility for future prosecution for crimes committed by Ying Sari. We really pay attention to the word use, that is the word pardon, which does not bar the prosecution of Ying Sari before any tribunal that shall be established in the future. In the same year, that is in 1996, Mr. Thomas Hammerberg, the UN representative for human rights in Cambodia, adds, the Prime Minister explained to him that the intention of the amnesty is to give initiatives for the mass defection, the degree for injury is to prevent any future prosecution of him for the sentence by the court in 1979 and the possibility that he shall not be prosecuted for violations of the law to outlaw the Democratic Cambodia group. Therefore, the arguments raised by the Defense Council cannot be relied upon. And on behalf of the prosecution, I urge your honors to reject in its entirety all the arguments raised by the defense team in order for to protect the interest and to provide justice to the victims and to those who died during the Democratic Cambodia, because Ying Sari is the person within the senior leaders of that regime when he was in power. This is my submission to honor, and I'd like now to give the floor to my colleague, Mr. William Smith, to provide the second argument on the chamber's obligation to prosecute for various crimes injury committed between the period of 75 to 79. Thank you, your honor. Good morning, Your Honours Council. Uh, as you have just heard, we submit that the Royal Decree did not, nor was it intended to, to extend to provide an amnesty for the prosecution of geno genocide or similar related crimes before this Court. On the basis of my colleagues' submissions and on the basis of the submissions we've put to the Chamber in the past, we ask we ask that the uh, preliminary objection be dismissed on that basis alone. Before I answer Your Honour's questions in relation to whether or not witnesses should be called on this issue, and also to your fundamental question as whether or not you have the power to invalidate an amnesty for genocide if you believed that is in fact what was the intention, I'd like to make three quick remarks to uh, what was raised by my learned friends, the Yang Sari Defence Team, and their remarks that perhaps need to be made initially because they certainly jarred in my mind and I think uh, they should jar in your honours. Firstly, they state that there was no benefit to Mr Yang Sari to agree to defect to the government unless he got an amnesty for uh, against or for a genocide prosecution that may occur in the future. My first answer to that, Your Honours, is from the evidence you can see from the pardon, the benefit was his life. He got his life back despite the fact that in 1993, um, by the Constitution, the death penalty was abolished. 
it was quite prudent and quite cautious of the, uh, of the King and the Cambodian government to ensure that that death sentence never be carried out in the future. Secondly, the next no that jarred my mind was when the defence stated, the International Defence Council stated, I know, no, I know of no international jurisprudence or convention that says a state must prosecute or punish offenders of Yus Kogan's crimes or crimes of similar types to genocide. The defence have stated they are only aware of conventions that request and comply states to not commit acts of genocide. I turn your honours to the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide where at Article 1 it states, the contracting parties confirm that genocide, whether committed in time of peace or in time of war, is a crime under international law which they undertake to prevent and to, to punish. The third point that I would like to briefly remark to is the National Defence Council for Yang Sari stated, this court can only apply national Cambodian law. As your honours know, if you look at the first, one of the first articles in the statute of this court, Article 2 New, it states that the chambers shall be established to bring to trial senior leaders in relation to violations of Cambodian laws related to crimes, international humanitarian law and custom and international conventions recognised by Cambodia. And your honours are well aware of the procedural law that must be followed, which is Cambodian law, uh, unless it conflicts uh, with international standards and international practice. So the position put forward, Your Honour, that this court can only apply national Cambodian law couldn't be um, more wrong. Going back to the submissions, Your Honour, if for the sake of argument we submit that even if you found the scope of the decree was intended to provide an amnesty for genocide and similar crimes, this cannot be binding on this court. It is our position to you that as judges presiding in this unique internationalised court, you have an independent and fundamental obligation under international law to not allow an amnesty to protect Yang Sari from facing this trial for genocide and other crimes. We respectfully submit this obligation still exists whether or not the decree is in conformity with the Constitution, particularly Articles 27 and 19 U. We ask that our prior submissions in relation to these matters be taken into account. I'll first address the general obligation of an internationalised court, such as the ECC, under international law not to uphold amnesties for genocide and Yus Kogan's crimes. I will then address the particular issue of the constitu constitutionality of the decree. The defence argue first that the ECC is not an internationalised court, and I know we've spent a reasonable amount of time on this matter, but I think a few further things need to be said. And they also say, even if it is this court has no legal authority or power to invalidate an amnesty or pardon for genocide or Yas Kogan's crimes. As discussed yesterday, the issue of the interna internationalised nature of this court has been decided many times, at least, at least six from our review, by this chamber and the pre-trial chamber. The ECC jurisprudence is consistent that this court is an internationalised court that operates as an independent entity within the court structure of Cambodia. The chamber and the pre-trial chamber, this chamber and the pre-trial chamber has directly applied international law throughout the entire proceedings. In discussing the issue of legality in the Doik judgment at page 30, your honours stated, 
As regards relevant sources of international law applicable at the time, the Chamber may rely on both customary and conventional international law, including the general principles of law recognised by the community of nations. In applying the, joint, in applying the concept of joint criminal enterprise in the same judgment at paragraph 510, you held, ultimately, joint criminal enterprise as applied by this chamber follows from custody international law, not national law. This court has consistently accepted its internationalised nature and the necessity and ability to apply international law directly to its mandate. I refer you to paragraph 579 of your judgment where you hold the ECC, like other internationalised tribunals, is entrusted with reducing crimes of considerable enormity and scope into individualised sentences. Additionally, the process of sentencing is intended to convey the message that globally accepted laws and rules have to be obeyed by all, irrespective of their status and rank. On this basis, it's well settled, Your Honours, that the ECC is an internationalised court, albeit set in the domestic structure in Cambodia. And, the, and Cambodia's international ob obligations do not affect the court's amnesty and pardon. To put that, one, put that again, we ask that you re reject the defence admissions that this is a domestic court and therefore Cambodia's international obligations do not affect the court's considerations on amnesty and pardon. Similarly, we ask that you reject the defence alternative submission that as an internationalised court, the ECC cannot apply international law directly. The Chamber and Pre-Trial Chamber has shown this over the last four years. Finally, the defence argue in an alternative submission that even if this court could apply international law directly, it could still not hold the decree to be invalid. This is on the basis that there is, they state, there is no norm or standard that allows an internationalised court to invalidate a validly granted amnesty or pardon. We ask that this argument be rejected as international jurisprudence states the opposite. In 1998 at the ICTY, in the case of Anto Frunzia on the 10th of December that year, the trial chamber held that amnesties for Yas Kogan's crimes, such as torture as a crime against humanity, would be inconsistent with international law. They held that any domestic amnesty law would not prevent prosecution for torture before the ICTY or any other foreign jurisdiction or the same state under a different regime. In arriving at this conclusion, they discussed at paragraph 155 the, senseless, the senselessness of the situation if international law allows states to have international obligations to prevent and punish crimes by establishing national legislation on the one hand, yet on the other, a state is allowed to condone torture or absolve its perpetrators through an amnesty law. In such a situation, they held that the national measures violating the general principle and any relevant treaty positions, provisions would produce the legal effects discussed above and addition would not be accorded international legal recognition. They said holding such amnesties would be unlawful and I state what is even more important is that perpetrators of torture acting under, acting upon or benefiting, benefiting from other national measures may never, nevertheless be held criminally responsible for torture, whether in a foreign, a foreign state or in their own state under a subsequent regime. Six years later, in two, 2004, on the 13th of March two, that year, six years later, the Special Court of Sierra Leone Appeals Chamber upheld the same principle in the cases of Calon, Kamara and Kondewa by refusing to allow claims of amnesty to pre prevent prosecutions 
for Yas Kogan's crimes. The appeals chamber held that there was a crystallising international norm that a government cannot grant amnesty for serious violations of crimes under international law, and this is amply supported. In relation to an internationalised court, the appeals chamber specifically held that a domestic pardon should not apply in respect of the prosecution of Yas Kogan's crimes. They held, even in the opinion, even if the opinion is held that Sierra Leone may not have breached customary law in granting an amnesty, this court is entitled in the exercise of its discretionary power to attribute little or no weight to the grant of such amnesty, which is contrary to the direction in which customary international law is developing and which is contrary to the obligations in certain treaties and conventions, the purpose of which is to protect humanity. And that's at paragraph 84. Over the last 10 years, Your Honours, this customary law continues to develop, particularly as evidenced by the statements of the United Nations Secretary Generals who represent over at least 190 member states. In 1999, in Sierra Leone, the Secretary General, as the moral guarantor to the Lome Peace Accord, which contained general amity provisions stated or attached an important proviso, the United Nations interprets that the amnesty and pardon in Article 9 of this agreement shall not apply to international crimes of genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and other serious violations of international humanitarian law. Then in 2000, the Secretary General again stated in his report on the establishment of the Special Court of Sierra Leone, while recognising that amnesty is an accepted legal concept and a gesture of peace and reconciliation at the end of a civil war, or an internal armed conflict, the United Nations has consistently maintained the position that amnesty cannot be granted in respect of international crimes such as genocide, crimes against humanity and other serious crimes. UN document number S2915, paragraph 22. And again, in 2004, the Secretary General stated in his report on the rule of law and transitional justice in conflict and post-conflict societies that the UN shall ensure that peace agreements and Security Council res resolutions and mandates reject any endorsement of amnesty for genocide, war crimes or crimes against humanity, including those relating to ethnic, gender and sexually based international crimes and ensure that no such amnesty previously granted is a bar to prosecution before any United Nations created or assisted court. That's document number, UN document number S2004616. Your Honours, as with the other international and internationalised courts, you bear the duty to uphold the United Nations commitment to combat impunity for genocide and other Yas Kogan's crimes. Significantly, Cambodia is a signatory to the Genocide Convention, which requires individuals committing genocide to be prosecuted and punished by the state. And this is a parallel obligation to ensure that amnesties for these crimes are declared inapplicable. Contrary to the defence assertion, Your Honours, there is no customary international law prohibiting you as judges in an internationalised court from declaring an invalid, as invalid, a domestic amnesty for genocide. In fact, the opposite is true. If you believe the decree granted an amnesty for genocide, it's our submission that you have the obligation, or at least a discretion, to give it no weight. We ask that you reject the defence arguments on these points, as in their written pleaders, pleadings, it's largely supported by a few academic articles that state the position as of the late 1990s. Similarly, they avoid largely the fact that state practice, as evidenced by the Security uh, the Secretary General's statements over the last 10 years, has solidified significantly since the Frunzia decision in 1998. 
Similarly, the defence minimised the responsibility of a state not to provide amnesties, particularly when they are parties to the Genocide Convention, which creates an obligation to prevent and punish these crimes. Turning now to your power under Article 40 to determine the scope of the RPA, the Royal Pardon and Amnesty, we submit that the defence argument that you have the power to determine the scope but not the validity makes no sense. It's axiomatic that to determine the scope you must be able to determine the validity. This court cannot be in the position where it finds itself that the decree has no scope to cover amnesty but cannot determine validity. This would completely frustrate the purpose of Article 40 new. Regarding the constitutionality of the decree, it's our submission as an internationalised court, you have, a power, you have the power to determine this issue. As previously submitted, the royal decree did not, nor was it intended to provide an amnesty for the prosecution of genocide. From the plain reading of the words in the decree, there is no evidence of an intention to grant an amnesty that was in contravention to Article 31 of the Constitution. Article 31 states, the Kingdom of Cambodia shall recognise and respect human rights as stipulated in the United Nations Charter, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the Covenants and Conventions related to human rights, women's and children's rights. The defence argue that Article 27 of the Constitution, which grants the King's uh, the power to grant partial or complete amnesty, is unlimited, is clearly wrong. As part of a normal statutory construction rules, rules, the provisions of a legal instrument should be read in the context of each other. In particular, it's clear that the amnesty would be unconstitutional if it was not to respect covenants and conventions as referred to in Article 31. This, of course, would include states' obligations to prevent, prosecute and punish uh, acts of genocide. Based on our previous arguments rega regarding the scope of the prosecution, we agree with the finding of the pretrial chamber in their decision on Yang Sari's appeal at 201, paragraph 201, there is no indication that the King and the others involved intended not to respect the international obligations of Cambodia when adopting the decree. The defence argument that the Constitution places no limits on the crimes which may be amnestied and pardoned is at odds with the correct inter interpretation by the pretrial chamber and surprisingly with the defence oral submissions yesterday and today. They argued that Article 31 of the Constitution required Cambodia to respect covenants and treaties, so therefore the principle of nabis and edem under the ICCPR would apply. Yet at the same time, in their written submissions, they argued that the King's amnesty power is unlimited, necessarily meaning that it was not bound by Article 31. This position on the issue should be rejected. To conclude, Your Honours, we submit that the decree did not, nor was it intended, to provide an amnesty for genocide and other crimes in the future. Again, for argument's sake, if Your Honours found it did, this chamber has the discretion to reject such an amnesty on the basis that it did not comply with international treaty obligations and customary international law on the issue. It should also be rejected because of this court's obligation as an internationalised court to uphold principles in treaties and conventions, the purpose of which is to protect humanity. In answer to your point as to whether or not witness should be called, witnesses should be called, called as to the intention of the scope of the Royal Pardon and Amnesty, we submit that the intention is clear and they are not required. And secondly, we also submit that Your Honours should rule on the issue of whether or not, even if the Royal Pardon Amnesty was intended to cover crimes of genocide and the other crimes in this indictment, you should consider 
whether or not you have your obligation and you should exercise your discretion whether or not you would allow that to occur in the first place. Only after you've asked that question, it's submitted, Your Honours, that any issue of calling witnesses would be necessary. So for all the reasons we've provided in our written submissions and those provided by my colleague and I today, we request that this primary objection be dismissed. Thank you, Your Honours. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Co-Prosecutor, for your response. It is now time for us to break for lunch. But before we break, uh, we would like to ask Mr. Ian's defense of whether your clients wish us to participate in the afternoon session. Uh, Council Ang Dom. Mr. President, I would like to consult with my clients before I can answer your question because I cannot decide by myself. I believe that um, my clients can come to the court only once in a while. But again, I would like to seek your permission that I consult with my client before I can answer to your question. Perhaps I can answer your question in the afternoon session whether he can come to the court. The President, we are concerned that uh, there could be possible disturbance just like what we had yesterday. But now the Chamber announced the uh, recess for lunch break and the court will come back at 1.30 to continue our proceedings. Detention facility guards are directed to escort the accused persons to the cells downstairs and bring them together with Mr. Ian Siri for the afternoon session by 1.30. สมเจนกราวชอง